Um, okay, so, uh, so um, mathematical tools of quantum mechanics. So what I uh, intend to do here is just give a qualitative introduction to the uh, to um, the mathematics of quantum mechanics. Um, now, what kind of mathematics do we need to describe quantum mechanical experiments? And what are some of the features that are specific to quantum phenomena? Uh, so, in a kind of a thought experiment, I'm going to um, just tell you the kinds of uh, experimental results that you would expect. What, what, how would experiments behave if you did experiments on a quantum on a quantum system? And from that, we will see what kind of mathematics we need to describe it. Okay, so it's kind of uh, not the usual way of, uh, of that that you, that you learn um, at university. Okay, so we're doing it the other way around. Right? So it's actually mainly qualitative today, and so it's not rigorous at all, and it's, it's, it's quite you know, a little bit fuzzy and uh, very fuzzy, depending on your definition of fuzziness. Um, but the important thing is that you get the general idea and some important um, specific points, okay? And I, I hope that they'll come, come through very clearly. There are a lot of examples of quantum weirdness that we won't cover today. There's just, you know, there, there's, there, there's just not enough time. But I will mention them as we go, go, along, go along in the rest of the semester. Starting from next week, we'll, we will look at the mathematics uh, more carefully, not from not the precision that a mathematical physicist would be used to. We're not interested in that sort of precision. We don't want to build up the entire theory extremely precisely because what will happen is that you spend three or four lectures doing the most elementary things and, and you don't learn enough physics. So what we'll do is do a, a quite a careful mathematical introduction um, from uh, Cohen to Nuji the book by Cohen Tanuji and the other authors, uh, which is which is mathematical enough for our purposes. Right? If you want a specialist mathematical um, physics introduction, you can ask Professor Richard over in, in maths. Uh, he's actually an expert in uh, mathematical physics. All right. Um, now, the reason I want a simple qualitative introduction today is that once you get immersed in the technical details, as we will over the next five or six weeks, it's easy to lose sight of the big picture. So what I want to do today is to present the big idea in an intuitive way so that you have this picture in your mind as you're learning the more specific mathematics. Okay? Um, one important aspect that I don't talk about today at all is how classical physics intuition completely fails to explain quantum reality, especially what's called local realism. But what I will do is send out an email, you know, probably with the URL to this video, uh, to videos by Alain Aspect, uh, this, a, a French guy who's a really great, uh, he's done really great experiments. Uh, and actually, I've met him and had beers with him. He's a great guy to talk to, um, and and he's um, and, and the, the video is also very entertaining, very interesting uh, on uh, fundamental quantum mechanics. Right, and yeah, so they're on YouTube, but I'll, I'll send the URLs later. Okay, so what kind of Mathematics do we need to describe quantum mechanical experiments? Right, so we're going to carry out a thought experiment on something called a qubit. A qubit is a quantum bit. And it's essentially a two-state system 
Um, and it can take two, so it means it can take two values, plus one or minus one. And actually what a quantum, what a qubit is, is it's, a, it's an, usually an unpaired electron uh, in some compound or some substance. Um, and, and it's the electron spin that, that creates a magnetic moment, an intrinsic magnetic moment to the particle. And a magnetic moment is just like a bar magnet, okay? Just think of it as a little bar magnet. And what you detect experimentally is the magnetic moment. Right? So you can tell uh, whether the, which direction the magnetic moment is pointing in by, by using um, a probe that's sensitive to mag magnetism. I mean, that's all we need to know for the moment. Uh, obviously, there's a lot more to say about spin and the nature of spin. We don't care for the moment. Just, we have a system, there's two degrees of freedom, but uh, it gives either plus one or minus one results. And we'll call our measuring apparatus this kind of weird looking capital A, script A. Okay, that's A apparatus. And this apparatus makes measurements and records the results. And it has an orientation relative to the laboratory frame. So you might imagine that the apparatus is some sort of box. It has an arrow on it like this, so that we know uh, which direction the, the, uh, the apparatus is facing. It has a readout here, which reads either plus one or, um, or minus one, or it can have you know, an up arrow, or down arrow, or anything. And here we have a button a button here, we press this button if we want to make a measurement. So we press the button if you want to make a measurement. Uh, we, we, we put the, we line up the uh, apparatus to the axis that we want. Here is the laboratory frame, the z-axis is up, the x-axis is that way, the y-axis is that way. Um, and we line up the apparatus in the direction that we want, we press the button, and there's a spin, there's a, there's a spin in there, there's a cubit in there. And we, and we press the button and and that some reading comes out, comes out there. Okay, so it's extremely simple. So what we do first is we point the apparatus along the z-axis, just as I have it here. And initially, we don't know in what state the the qubit is in. It could be in either the state plus one or minus one. But we want to determine um, what this variable sigma is. So. Um, before the apparatus interacts with the spin or with the magnetic moment, the digital readout is blank. And after measuring the magnetic moment, we'll see either plus one or minus one. All right. So, what we do is, let's say we press the button and we get a, a plus one reading in the, in the display. And then, oh, there's a reset button as well. So this is a, a measure button, measure button, and this is a reset button. The reset button means it just resets the display, makes it blank, okay? So we press the button, uh, measure, and you get a plus one, reset, it blanks the, um, blanks the display. If I press measure again, I get a plus one again. And if, I, if I don't touch the apparatus, I press it again. Okay, press reset, blank, measure it again, get a plus one again. Okay. Nothing surprising there. Right. Haven't done anything, nothing's changed, you get a plus one all the time. Right. Now what if um, I've got, uh, I've, if the first time I, I press measure, I've got a minus one. And then I press reset, blanks the display, measure, you get a minus one again. Okay. Nothing surprising there. So we know that there are two distinct states, plus one and minus one, because we've just we've just measured them. Okay. Well, it's just it's just random. I mean, well, we we start off we don't know which state it's in, but after we press it, it's always in the same state. So there's something has happened, something significant has happened. Bef before we start, we don't know which state it's in. After we measure it, it stays in that state forever. One thing. So we start and measure that, it's in that state forever. If we start and we measure that, it's in that state forever. Okay? 
So what that's saying is that the apparatus has forced the qubit into a known state after the first measurement. Okay? It has forced the qubit into a known state. That's called preparing the system. So your first measurement prepares the system. It forces the system into a particular state. Right. Why do we say that the system is what sets the apparatus? Is it what, what is what forces the apparatus? Classically, you think that the the, the qubit is the, the apparatus the forces, the, forces the forces the system to be in a particular state. Yeah, but in the classically, wouldn't it be the opposite? Because the system is in a particular state, and the apparatus is just treat. Yeah, like like some some our our qubit is in a particular state. We don't know that. We don't know what state the qubit is at the start. So how can you tell that it it was forced. In, it was forced in oh. the yeah. um, or it was already there and we just measured it? Oh, actually, that's a good question. Well, we'll find out in a minute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's a good point. Uh, the word forced is maybe um, too strong to use based on the evidence so far. Yeah, yeah. Good point. Yeah, I'll take note of that. Um, but what is true is that. Well, maybe we need a few more um, um, examples, uh, types of experiments, and we'll see that in a minute. Okay, now, what if we prepare, uh, say, a plus one? So now we get the get our apparatus, line it up. There's this z-axis, and um, there's the arrow in the apparatus, and we measure. Uh, measure a plus one right? and then we blank it by pressing that button and then we turn the apparatus upside down right? what will happen then so we turn it, turn it upside down depends on what the quantity is if it's something to do with spatial orientation then is, is the are we rotating the qubit as well yeah oh oh oh, 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 oh. Are we just oh, rotating on frame? No, we're actually just 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 um just rotating the apparatus. Oh, okay. Yeah, without the cube. So it should. Uh, so it should now, 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 now measure it. What, what's what will, if it's yes. plus one there? What will happen? Minus one. It goes minus one. Right? You measured minus one. <coughs> now, without moving the apparatus, I measure it again. What will I measure? Negative one. Negative one. So nothing's changed. <coughs> okay, and I'll keep measuring. I always get down to minus one. If I now turn this, if I now um, okay. In fact, the, the sequence that I want to get uh, clear is that I want to have the first measurement with the uh, apparatus oriented in a particular direction, in this case along the z-axis, measures the plus one. So it's, I'm going to use the terminology prepared the state, plus one, because it's looking into the future. Right? I mean, that's yeah, with, with the hindsight, plus one. And then, if I, and then prepare the state, turn it around, measure, I get minus one. And if I get plus one there, then if I use this process, I will always get minus one. Right. On the other hand, if I start off with the minus one that way, and I turn it around and then press, uh, press the re re um, um, button, I always get plus one. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so. It seems that this is completely normal. It seems that we're dealing with a vector because uh, because there it's kind of pointing. Let's say for this plus one, it's pointing up that way, and here here it's um, uh, pointing in the opposite direction relative to what the apparatus is measuring. Okay, and now so the sequence would be measure, turn, measure, get something, reset, put it back up that way, prepare it again turn it around, measure. Prepare it again, turn it around, measure. Okay, that's the sequence. So after each measurement, you prepare it. You prepare it. Right. right, so it certainly seems as if the states plus one and minus one are mutually exclusive, and the, the, which means that the system can be made to be purely in one or the other state. 
and also the states are defined relative to an axis embedded in the measuring apparatus. Okay. It actually, the measured object and the measuring apparatus can't be considered as separate entities. I'm not sure if we can conclude that yet, but we're not meant to be deductive. We're kind of slipping in extra facts um, as we're going along. So, um, it seems as if the spin states can be represented as basis vectors in a two-dimensional vector space. Okay, what's, what is it about basis vectors? Well, for example, oh, um, well, basis vectors, uh, especially if the basis vectors are perpendicular to each other, orthogonal, okay? Now, it's, it's especially orthogonal, then it would say, well, well, the system can be entirely in this state or entirely in this state. And if these are, if these are orthogonal, then, um, then this state has no amount of this state in it. Because if they weren't orthogonal, let's say if our basis was that, which is you know, a perfectly good basis for a two-dimensional vector space, then this, this basis vector actually um, contains part of um, this direction and part of this direction, so linear superposition. But Professor, you, you always like say that you can do bananas and oranges. Right, but here we're just talking about spin up or spin down. So can it be half 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 spin? Well, yeah, but what we want is to represent the uh, we we need the basis to represent a general state of the system. So the how what sort of basis do we want? Well, we've seen that there's a pure state where the spin is up and there's a pure state where the spin is down. So, it would seem that what we want is a basis where the basis vectors are orthogonal. Okay. okay? And what's actually very useful is if they were unit vectors. Um, it doesn't have to be unit vectors, but it's just useful. And orthogonality is the fact that they're exclusive. Yes, orthogonality, the mathematical idea of orthogonality uh, captures the fact that they're exclusive, yeah, mutually exclusive. Right. So, but the thing that you said about unit vectors, um, how would we introduce that in our case? The well, um, we just need to represent a spin up, or a spin down. This state, the, the spin up state, let's just say arbitrarily is a unit vector. Oh, okay. So okay. We can, we can find arbitrarily it. like that. We, we want any kind of mathematical image that will capture the, the, the physics that we see in the experiment. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, but now we're talking about orthogonality. So what we're talking about is an inner product. If you remember uh, what an inner product is, uh, I'm going to write the inner product with a vertical line. Now, you. I don't know what sort of notation you've seen in a product up until now. What's the inner product, by the way? Uh, how, would, how would you define it or describe it? It depends for, on the. For the. It depends on the. Hilbert space. Yeah, for the machine. The Hilbert space. Okay. So, uh, what, what, what is this a generalization of? What, what scale, idea? Of scale. Scale. Product. Product. Okay. Product. It, it's a generalization of a dot product. Yeah. Okay. Of dot product of two vectors x, dot y. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so if you have. In, in two dimensions, you have one vector, let's say x, and another vector, let's say y, then x dot y is x, y, cos of the angle between them. And so that's just x, you can interpret it as x cos theta, x, the, the length of this cos theta, which is the projection of x onto this axis, and um, times, times y. Yeah. Um, or the projection of y onto onto x and multiply them together. Okay. Um, so if you have uh, two orthogonal vectors, the the insight or the like, the intuition is that this vector, the dot product is zero, and that that means that there is. This vector here contains none of this vector in it. That's not the intuition. Okay. All right. Now, this the idea of this idea of dot product. This is for just um, vectors in, in a vector space. 
But in general, uh, you can have um, functions um, and the inner product is defined in terms of an integral as you saw um, last year in Mathematical Physics 1. Okay? Yeah, you saw lots of examples of the inner product. Yeah, okay? so, so we're going to generalize to the inner product space. So basically, we want the idea of orthogonality, but uh, we, we're going to make it as general as possible so what we want is an inner product space. Um, only the perpendicularity of the vectors matters. So we may as well just take unit vectors. Right? In fact, there's, there's another reason. It doesn't have to be unit vectors, as you'll see later on. I'll, I'll explain it later. We also need something called completeness, which I'll talk about in a minute. So what we're talking about is we need an inner product space. Um, the basis vectors represent uh, representing mutually exclusive quantum states of orthonormal, where there are two or an infinite number of them. We have found that so we have found a pair of mutually exclusive basis vectors for the case when we measure spins along the z-axis. We can tell that they're basis states by preparing a state along the z-axis, then making a measurement with the apparatus oriented in either, either up or down, and the result is 100% predictable. That's how you know that the system is in the basis state because it's 100% predictable. Um, but we could measure, after we prepare the spin, we could measure the spin along the x-axis, for example, plus x. Uh, then we would have the pair of basis vectors right or left. Um, well, we could have, yeah, we, we could have basis vectors right or left, or we could have in or out basis vectors. Um, well, it depends on how you prepare the, the system. The basis vectors you choose depends on the measurement you want to make. That's another but principle. Each pair of basis vectors spans a two-dimensional inner product space. All, two -dimension, all finite dimensional inner product spaces where the axes are orthogonal, the generalized Euclidean spaces are isomorphic. That's just a theorem from um, function, functional analysis. Ah, now, this is a, a really basic point which you should remember forever. The names, and in, and in general, not just uh, spins, the names up, down, left, right, in, out, come from our Euclidean space, which what I mean is like R3, R3, the laboratory space, where the measurement apparatus exists. But the basis vectors themselves exist in a different space. They exist in an abstract inner product space in which they are orthogonal or orthonormal. So there is a correspondence between the Euclidean space where the apparatus resides, the laboratory reference frame, if you like, and the inner product space that represents the state of the quantum system. So they, in a sense, they coexist on top of each other. Right? And if you transform one of them, say, if you rotate um, the apparatus, then you have to also, at the same time, rotate the, the, the inner product space that you use to represent the particles the system. Okay? Otherwise, uh, the mathematical model will not match the experimental reality. So we strongly suspect that the spin sigma is some kind of vector. So we ascribe three components to it, sigma x, sigma y, sigma z. When the apparatus is oriented along the plus or plus z axis, it is positioned to measure sigma z, or minus z axis, it is positioned to measure sigma z, and obviously so on for sigma y and sigma x. Already, again, y axis. So we have six axes? Yeah. Well, there are, there are three axes, x, y, and z. And, and two state states. And two states for each. Yeah. All right, now, stage three. Let's now prepare a spin, sigma z equals plus one, by orienting 
the apparatus along the plus z-axis and making a measurement. In fact, what you do is um, you, you just keep, keep measuring qubits until you get a plus one. Because uh, you don't know what state it is at the start. You could, you could press a button, you could get a minus one. And if you get a minus one, that's not what we want. We want a plus one. So you keep, so you get another spin, throw that one away, get another one, measure it, eventually you get a plus one. Okay, keep the plus one. So you've prepared a spin in the plus one, so that your apparatus is pointing upwards, and you've got a plus one. There's the z-axis. And now we rotate it 90 degrees. Like that. Okay? And so we've prepared a spin that's plus one along the z-axis, and we rotate the apparatus by 90 degrees to the right of like that. Question is, what do we measure now? <coughs> only, only in, in the side axis, only the apparatus is set to only measure the sigma z. It doesn't tell us anything about sigma, sigma x. What would it be classically if, if the spin was a classical vector? What would it be classically? Half up. Classically. What would it be half up? One plus one. If you've got a vector that's pointing up, yeah, uh, and, then you, and then you look at it in this direction. Oh, oh, okay. My if, if zero. You, zero. Zero. Oh, zero. 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 Classically, you get zero. Yeah. It's a projection of this measuring apparatus onto the original vector would be zero if it's a classical vector. In fact, what you get is you will get either plus one or minus one. Okay? Either plus one or minus one. So suppose we get plus one. You write it down, you write down the plus one, and then you you uh, press reset, press reset and you turn that apparatus back up along the z-axis and let's prepare another plus one spin. Turn it sideways, measure it again, what will you see? Prepare a plus one along the z-axis, turn it around 90 degrees, measure it again, what will you see? Either plus one or minus one. Suppose we get a plus one. Okay. Do it again. Prepare a plus one. Turn it around. Plus Measure. One. What do you get? Either, Either minus one. one or plus one. Suppose you get a minus one. And so you get plus one or minus one. You get only either plus one or minus one. And they're random. Random. So, Professor, the this apparatus does it does it test only one of the sigma components, or does it test sigma in general? It tests the it tests the projection of sigma onto this the internal axis that's pointing this way. Yeah. Now, if I so so one one factor it always produces either plus one or minus one. Second, if you a uh, second is random between, them. Yeah. but you know in general you know random numbers can have a bias, even yeah. though they're random. You could you could have a one a plus one ninety nine point nine percent of the time and a zero zero point one percent of the time. That that's still random. <clears throat> but what happens if you the special angle ninety degrees? What you get is a plus one with probability a half and a minus one with probability a half. So if you kept going, getting this, this is a random sequence, and uh, eventually, uh, you, know, you know, random numbers, coin tosses, can give a long sequences of heads, and you can, if you had a cumulative um, graph, you could you could go all the way out here before you ever came back. But if you took the limit as 
the number of measurements tends toward infinity, you're guaranteed that you're going to get an average of zero. So, in fact, even though it seems not, each single measurement seems not deterministic, overall, the average value or the expectation value of the observable, what well, this is called an observable, is the classical value, which is going to be cos theta. Yeah. So theta is 90 degrees, cos of 90 is zero. So the average value is zero. The average value uh, after an infinite number of measurements. Yeah. And of course, if theta is 45 degrees, then it'll be biased towards plus one instead of minus one. Um, one more important point about the measurement process. In classical experiments, you can, in principle, be arbitrarily gentle as you, measure, as you make the measurement. So, classically, if this was some sort of a, um, um, if this was some sort of a classical vector, then I could sort of maybe tune down the voltage on my apparatus or something, and I make it really low voltage or something. Right? Make the disturbance as, as, as small as possible. Um, and and then I, t I, 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 I then I turn the apparatus. So I, I prepare a plus one. I turn the apparatus sideways. Like that. And I can make it arbitrarily classically. I can make it arbitrarily um, gentle. And I would get say a minus one there. And then I could I would rotate it back and be arbitrarily gentle. Oh, I could arbit be arbitrarily gentle, make it minus one. Uh, but then if I turn it back, I could be arbitrarily gentle. It, it would be maybe I don't know classically. It would be minus one if it was classical. So it doesn't really make sense, but. It can be arbitrarily gentle in classical physics, but in quantum mechanics, every experiment makes a, a drastic disturbance. Right. So, and the way to see it um, is you prepare a plus one state, like I did there, rotate it 90 degrees, so it's pointing along the plus x direction. You measure the spin. Let's say you get a minus one, and then, or, or you can don't worry about it, anything, turn it back and measure it again. What would you get? Plus one. Okay, so do you get, do you get the question? Prepare a plus one spin, <laughs> rotate the apparatus, measure something. You measure it, you may get a plus one or a minus one. And then without resetting the apparatus this time, rotate it back so that it points along the z-axis. What does your quantum measurement measure? Plus one. Plus one. Plus one. Either plus one. Either plus one or minus one randomly. Because you didn't reset the Because we said exactly. exactly, Shinji's got it. Because I didn't reset the apparatus, right? And what the what the apparatus does, it it forces the system into a pure state. And it and it and the, and the, and the, and the, the that forcing process, the disturbance process, um, gives you a random number. Either plus one, it's got to be either plus one or minus one because they're the only outcomes are possible for a measurement of a spin component, spin half component. So essentially, we made when we did it, it's now as if it's in the upright case when we forced it in. We this is exactly this is this is very similar to what we had just a minute ago, where 
see, if, if I prepare a plus one and I turn it around sideways like that and I measure there, let's say I get a, well, I could get a plus one or minus one with 50, with 50, 50, with 50 percent probability, right? Exactly the same. Now what's happened is that, say we get a plus one, what's happened is that I've prepared a plus one spin here. I've prepared a plus one spin. And now I rotate it back. In fact, we have the same, basically the same situation. Now I make a measurement and it's random, plus one and minus one. And since it's 90 degrees, uh, it's, the probability is 50%. So if I just turn this, I make it random all the time. If I measure, turn, measure, turn, it's always going to be random. Right. So basically, after the measurement, it becomes random. If you if you, if you, if you rotate, mm -hmm. rotate mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. mm -hmm. You prepare, yeah. you prepare, yeah. and you turn, you get a random result. Except if you turn it 180 degrees. Okay. Then it's a 100% probability that you, get, that you get the opposite. It's a special number. Or Zero or 180 degrees. Or if you need this, we should. Or you leave it as it is. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. You leave it as it is, it's 2D by 0. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, but what this is telling us is that, see, the intermediate measurement has left the spin in a completely random configuration compared to the state that it was prepared in. It was prepared in a plus one, then you turn it 90 degrees. And you, you measure, and you get a random number, either plus one or minus one. But once it's measured, it is in the state that is point that is plus x plus in the in the plus x direction. You say it's a plus one in the plus x direction. Right? And so you prepare the state there. You turn it, measure, you get another random number. But it's now it's plus one or minus one relative to the axis of the apparatus which is parallel to the z axis this time. So the so what's that what they're saying is that the intermediate measurement has left the spin in a completely random configuration with respect to the next reading along the plus z axis. What, what it's also saying is that one cannot simultaneously know the components of spin along two different axes. Uh, but isn't but we know it's it's we forced it after we measured it. Oh, but we thought that spin was a vector. And if you, and we thought that uh, we, we measured, let's say, sigma y, uh, sigma x there. Here it's sigma z, here it's sigma x. But, um, so we thought that we measured this component and this component. And we thought, oh, oh, we knew that. Oh, and then we knew that. But then when we came to measure that again, we got some random number. So you couldn't know, we can't know these two simultaneously. Because as soon as we measure one of them, the whole thing like scrambles. Exactly. It, as soon as you measure one, the whole thing, well, it doesn't scramble. It, it, um, but it does scramble and it ends up in a, in a definite state in the direction of the axis of the, of, of the of apparatus. The so the apparatus plays a crucial role. The apparatus like forces the reality for like. <coughs> yeah. You can't separate in, in quantum mechanics, you can't separate the apparatus from what you're observing. Um, Okay, so now let's sort of summarize what we've done in a more quantitative way. Uh, and what comes out of this is that the complex number i must enter into the description of quantum objects. Okay. Why is there an i there? Um, yeah, there are, there are a couple of ways of looking at this, but this is, the, this is one of them. We'll see another one either at the end today or Thursday next, next week. So, um, the quantum state, okay, knowing a quantum state, what does it mean to know quantum state? Well, it's contrasted to knowing 
a, class, a, a state in, 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 in classical physics, a classical state. In classical physics, if you know the state of the system, it implies you know everything that is necessary to predict the future of that system for all time. Right? Um, with a caveat, 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 um, chaos theory, which I don't want to get into. Don't worry about it. So the classical system, if you know the state now, um, kind of in principle, at least what I thought up until 1880, you can know the uh, the um, the state forever because of Hamilton's equations. Okay. However, knowing the quantum state is something completely different. The idea of it is completely different. So roughly speaking, um, it, it, it's knowing as much as can be known about how the system was prepared. So if we prepared a plus one spin when the apparatus was pointing upward along the z direction, then we have prepared sigma z equals plus one. That's what we know. And that's the quantum state that it's in when we prepared it. Um, now, and remember that if we rotate the apparatus, if we move the apparatus, even, even translate it, but we're not worried about translation now, if we rotate the apparatus, we have to, it, it, this, the particle changes state. State. Anyway, the quantum state tells us all the possible results of the next observation together with the probability of each result. That's what we'll, that's what we'll formulate in a minute. Yeah. We, if we said if we rotate, then it's it's an action that's that changes the output. It, it, it changes the state of the particle. If you move the apparatus, it actually changes the state of the of the particle, even if the particle is somehow um, not moving inside the apparatus. The fact that the particle has some magnetic moment relative to the axis of the apparatus and that, that angle changes, it changes the state of the particle because you cannot specify the state of the particle independent of the apparatus. But then we said that no measurement in classical mechanics, the measurements can be arbitrarily gentle. Yeah. But in quantum mechanics, we can't say the same. So how do we know that re-measuring is arbitrarily gentle in quantum mechanics? How do you know measuring Measuring. How do you know what? If I measure a state in this in this state, then you just click the button. It just I didn't catch the last word. Uh, I just click the button again. Yeah. So uh, technically I didn't do anything, but is that arbitrarily gentle? Because it's a it's an act of I did something by by pressing the button. I measured something again. So is that arbitrarily gentle enough for it not to disturb the the, the system? That's an interesting question because I've often wondered whether, well, the thing is that if, you, if you're measuring, if your apparatus is pointing up and you have prepared a, already prepared a, a plus one state along the z-axis, and you measure it again, it means that the way you're disturbing it is somehow purely in the z-direction. So it's not introducing any other components. So the, the disturbance is not, so sideways at all. So the measurement doesn't uh, exchange the system in, in the other directions. Not, not in this case. Yeah, not in this case. It's somehow, somehow, <laughs> these measurements are pure. So it's like an idealized system. Yeah. The measurement is the, the disturbance is purely in the plus z direction in this measurement here. And so the particle starts off in the plus one along the state along the z axis. You, when you measure it, it still stays in the plus one state because the disturbance does not introduce any the ideal this idealized apparatus. The disturbance does not introduce any sideways um, disturbance. So it's idealized, but not the the, the classical idea. Oh no, no, it's 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 um. Well, I don't know. Maybe it's classical. I don't know. Yeah, let's move on.
Um, the quantum state tells us all the uh, the quantum state tells us all the possible results of the next observation together with the probability of each result. The next observation then prepares the system for the observation after that, and so on. So each observation prepares the system for the next observation. It's like you're going from one observation to the next in quantum mechanics. Okay? And at each observation, Unless, it's, unless you haven't done anything to the apparatus or moved it um, to another um, pure state, uh, you're parallel to a pure state, then um, you will get a random answer. Even if we like just move it and come back without measuring, it still um, makes the measurement run the second one. No. So, so we have to measure it in, in order to make um, right. it the right. Yes. Yeah. So if you, the question was, if you prepare a plus one in the z direction, and well, there's the axis, okay, plus one, and then you turn it like that, turn it sideways, yeah. and then without measuring it, you yeah. turn it back. If you haven't made a measurement, then you haven't made a disturbance. You haven't really um, done it. Yes, this is this is uh, this transformation is reversible. As long as you do it slowly. So there's a notion of quasi-static in quantum mechanics as well. It's called the ADAR battery. It's an ADAR battery. Um, if you, it's, it, it, if you, don't, you have to do it slowly enough not to disturb the wave function. Yeah. Um, OK, so what kind of mathematical structure can, can represent that? So first of all, um, if we, pre if we pre prepare a sigma z equals plus or minus 1, um, then what will represent the up state, the plus 1 state, as a ket of this thing here, with something there, is called a ket. Right, ever, who's heard of that before? That, that word, ket? I'm glad, I'm glad you heard of something. Yeah. Right, so so it's up if it's um, if sig sigma z equals plus one, and the sigma z equals minus one state is uh, down d. So these two kets will be the abstract representation of our basis vectors for the up or down state. Um, now, if we prepare, uh, if um, If we orient the apparatus along the plus x direction, there's x now, and we get a plus, and we and we get a plus one, we'll call this state the R state, the R ket. That's that's R for right. Okay. And if we get a minus one, we we'll call it left, the left ket. Okay. And similarly. If you um, you can have you know, if it's in the y-axis, so that means it's the it's the uh, uh, sort of looking out into us. Now, if this apparatus is pointing at us, the y-axis is that way. If we get a plus one here, that's called the out state. And if it's the other way. Hopeless at drawing. Anyway, that's a perspective arrow pointing that way. That's a, uh, oh sorry, if you get a minus one here, that's called an in state. Because, yeah, this is, this is the, the arrow is the arrow is pointing in the plus y direction, the apparatus is pointing in the plus y direction, and we get a minus one, that's called an in state. Okay? <clears throat> so all possible spin states of one spin can be represented in a two-dimensional vector space. Now what that means is that at any time, you're talking about either right or left, out or in, or up or down states. Each of those, each of these pairs of basis vectors um, is, 
it is enough to describe the, all the information about the system. So that is the same as saying there are no hidden variables. Only two basis vectors is enough, which is saying that there are no other variables that are needed. I'll just, that's a little bit um, uh, ambiguous, so I'll, it, it'll, it'll be clear in a few minutes. Let's arbitrarily choose up and down as our basis vectors. What that means is, by choosing the up and down as basis vectors, I've already said that the basis you choose depends on the measurement you want to make. So I'm going to eventually measure, eventually I'm going to put the apparatus up along the Z axis and I'm going to make a measurement. So we'll prepare the state in any by, by, by putting the apparatus in uh, orienting it in any possible direction in three-dimensional space in the laboratory. We prepare the state in any possible direction in three-dimensional space, and then we rotate it so that it's up along the pointing up along the z-axis. We make a measurement. So that means that we're choosing uh, the up and down as our basis vectors. Okay? The basis vectors you choose depends on the measurement you're making. Okay? Now, um, how does yeah. it depend on, on the measurement? So, do you mean just it depends on the direction, like the z-axis? The z-axis is defined by the z-axis in our laboratory. Yeah. Um, and then we prepare the state in any direction in the laboratory, yeah. in, in any you know, in three dimensions. So we prepare it. So we make a measurement in some direction. At, at this point, you, make, you, you, you put the apparatus in any direction you want, okay. make a measurement that has prepared a state. Okay. And then you turn it up that, yeah. and you make another measurement, and that's that's what, what the final the final answer. When we are just before we are ready to make the measurement, or actually when the when the particle was prepared, let's say let's say we orient the, the apparatus sort of out this way, we make a measurement, we prepare a state. It is in a superposition of of up and down states. The superposition is uh, coefficient alpha up times the up ket plus alpha down plus the down ket. Professor, yep. so the cut factor is different than uh, the, the, the usual vector. I mean, basis vectors would be perpendicular. The up and down in the conventional vector definition it's uh, in the same axis. It's different definition. Oh, the up vector. Yeah, the the words up and down, as we use them, we say, oh, up's that way and down's that way, they're opposite. But the up basis, in, in the abstract representation, they're orthonormal vectors. This is the abstract representation, this is your apparatus. So when you prepare the state ready to be measured along the plus z axis. The state is in a superposition of up and down with these coefficients like that. And in general, we'll just, just leave it as general as possible. So let's make these comp possibly complex. We have no reason to believe that they're complex here. Yeah. Um, now, by just the usual um, method, usual linear algebra, um, the alpha up is just um, the projection of your superposition onto the up basis. Okay, it's just the intuitive idea. You can just the picture in your mind. You can just have the usual dot product. Okay. And so similarly, alpha down is projection of the a superposition, a vector, onto the down basis vector. Okay. So these you read from right to left um, for a physical interpretation. The projection of A onto U, projection of A onto D. Okay. So 
to read it backwards. Um, now this, math, this is a mathematical abstraction and it has the following physical meaning. So first of all, given that the state, given that the spin has been prepared in the state A and that the measuring apparatus is then oriented in the, in the Z, along the Z axis, then the complex conjugate of U times alpha U times alpha U the complex conjugate of alpha u times alpha u is a real number, okay? Because the product of uh, a number and its complex conjugate is real. Okay. Um, and this is interpreted as a probability that the spin would be measured as plus one. Sigma z would be plus one. That's the probability. Similarly, that is the probability that the spin is measured as minus one. Okay. Before the measurement, all we know is this vector here, the superposition. It's like Schrodinger's cat. It's in the superposition of being dead and alive. Right. Is so. This state only represents the potential possibilities. It's, this is telling us that there are only two possibilities, up or down, and that they occur with certain probabilities. You cannot say that before the measurement, the spin was that, up. You can't say that it was down. All that you can say is that it was in a superposition. The act of measurement fundamentally changes the situation. But we can say that it goes up or down if we measure it in the z-axis before. After you measure it, after you make the measurement and you find, say, sigma z is plus one, then you have collapsed the superposition into a pure state. Okay. Um, okay. The other thing, the other um, things we know, we've already said. So we've already said the basic vectors are orthogonal. In fact, they need to be orthonormal. So I'll just say orthonormal. If these alpha, this alpha u, these alpha star alpha are, meant to, are probabilities, they have to be orthonormal. The physical meaning of the inner product of the vectors being zero is if a spin is prepared up and the orientation of A is unchanged, then the probability to detect it down is zero. That's what that means. And vice versa. They are mutually exclusive. Yeah, the two orthogonal states are, mutu are physically distinct and mutually exclusive. So all the mutually exclusive states in any quantum system are basis vectors on the following axes. Um, the probabilities can also be represented like this. Um, I just said alpha u star alpha u, but alpha u is A projected onto u, and alpha u star Is 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 uh, equal to the complex conjugate of that, which is going to be that. Okay, um, I haven't explained why that is so. We'll just accept it for now. The probabilities uh, can also be written. So the probabilities can also be written as projection of A onto U and times its complex conjugate reading from right to left. Professor? Yep. Can we measure all of the key directions at once? Nope. Not for spin. So why is it that we can only measure one? As in not not more. Find out in QM3. It's because rotations in real space do not commute. Doesn't tell you. 
When the measuring apparatus is oriented along the z-axis, the only possible results of an observation are plus one and minus one, and the sum of the probabilities must therefore be one. So that plus that must equal one. Okay. And the claim is, in fact, I sort of said it. The claim is, uh, and you can prove it as an exercise. The claim is that this equation is true. So this gives us an equation for the alpha, alpha ups and alpha down. Um, this is true if and only if A, the vector A, is normalized to 1. It's a unit vector. So there's something that you can prove. It's, it, it's, it's a good exercise to have a go at proving that because it's, it's only about three or four lines and you get to use the, um, you get used to the notation. Okay, so this is, a, this is a good little exercise to do. If you, if you can't get it, then just email me. It's very simple. In, in a few weeks' time, you'll think that this is absolutely true. In all quantum systems, the state of the system is represented by a normalized unit vector, that means unit vector, in a vector space of states. Moreover, the squared magnitude of the components of a state vector in the direction of any basis vector represent probabilities of outcomes of experiments. Right. Now, let's try to represent the basis vectors R and L in terms of the basis we have chosen up and down. Now, well, now first of all, why do you have the basis vectors R and L? Because sometimes you might prepare the state, prepare the system in some arbitrary state, let's say that way, and then you rotate the apparatus towards the plus x direction, you want to make a measurement. In that case, your basis is R and L. And so what if you want to see what happens if you, if you change the basis to up and down? Then you want to write R in terms of, R and L in terms of up and down. Because ultimately, you want to measure along the plus z direction. What does it mean? If an apparatus A is initially prepared in R, and is then rotated to measure sigma z, we know that up and down will be measured with equal probability. Alpha up start alpha up equals alpha down start alpha down equals a half. So, if given what we just said, one vector that can be used, one superposition, is 1 over square root 2 up plus 1 over square root 2 down. There are, and that will give you a probability of a half for up, probability of a half for down. But you could also have anything like, you could have plus or minus 1 over square root 2 up, plus or minus 1 over square root 2 down. So there are actually many possibilities for this. Uh, minus, uh, Minus plus, yeah, minus plus, yeah. Or you can even have plus or minus and plus or minus. There are a lot of possibilities. But by convention, um, you choose the one that's plus, and by convention, that's that one's there, plus. And in that case, if you choose that to be the representation of the R basis vector in terms of the up and down basis vectors, then you, then you need to, and you want to, um, and if, a, if the apparatus prepares the left vector, well, the left and right states are mutually exclusive so that the inner products are zero. So you use the fact that this inner product equals zero gives you an equation. Um, it's a simple, it's a simple equation um, that will give you this, that the left vector can be represented as one on square root two up minus one on square, square root two down. So right was plus plus, and left is minus uh, plus minus. So there's a minus sign there. 
you, you'll see that if you worked it out, you'll see that they're orthogonal. Okay. You can multiply any. You can multiply this vector or either vector by any complex number of unit modulus. The easiest way to write a complex number of unit modulus is to use polar notation, e to the i theta. That's a, that's a, that has unit modulus because the modulus of e to the i theta. Um, yeah, it's one. So that doesn't stretch the vector at all. Right? It doesn't change the length of it. But in a complex vector space, it actually rotates it a bit in some direction, but it doesn't change the length. So in fact, the choice of length, and, 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 and if you took the complex conjugate of that, you would get the same as before, but everywhere where you see i, you see minus i, and it has to multiply by e to the r theta, and that of course equals one. So taking, the, so multiplying by e to the r theta doesn't change the physics. So in fact, in quantum mechanics, any any state can be multiplied by well, by an overall vector, uh, a number of unit modulus e to the r theta, and doesn't change the physics. Doesn't change the predictions of the experiment. So really what it's saying, it's a little bit pedantic and we don't really need to worry about it too much, but quantum mechanical states are not represented by vectors in Hilbert space, but by rays in Hilbert space, e to the r theta. It's something that you might want to keep in the back of your mind. e to the r theta is called an overall phase factor. What would change is if you multiply this term, the up term by e to the r theta, and this term by e, e to the i um, phi with theta not equal to phi, or, or, or these diff two different numbers. That would change things. If the, this relative to that is changed. But if you have one overall factor, it doesn't, doesn't make a difference. All right. So, along the y axis, the basis vectors are in and out. And we want to write in and out in terms of the up and down basis vectors. What conditions must they, must they satisfy? Well, they're mutually exclusive, so orthogonality. If the spin is prepared along the plus y and is measured then along z, the measurement is equally likely to be up or down. So that means that you have this equation between this equation and that equation, the, if it's prepared in out, is measured along up, then the probability of that is a half. If it's prepared in up and measured down, then the probability is a half, so you have that, those two equations. If it's prepared along minus i, then that's prepared in i, measured along up, and the probability of that is a half, similarly for all the others. Um, or could be measured along the x-axis. Uh, prepared and up, measured along right. The probability is a half. So all these are a half down there. They have all these equations. Now, all these equations are enough to determine the in and out vector in terms of um, the up and down. But, um, but, uh, and obviously these are um, over highly overdetermined. You don't need them. You don't need most of them. You don't need the few. And the result is that the i vector is 1 on square root 2 up plus complex i divided by square root 2 down. So this i is inescapable. Okay. It comes from the fact that it comes from these values. Orthogonality and the probability of observation. That's where that up, and that's an, that's an assignment question next week. Okay. Uh, but did you, did you say that we can choose one and minus one? Um, what you're doing is the final measurement is going to be along the z-axis. 
So your basis vectors are up and down. Yeah. The question is, if you prepare the spin in the minus y direction, and if you measured it, what would be the probability of up, what would be the probability of down? And how would you write the i vector in terms of the up and down basis vectors? That's the question. And so, this what happens at this complex i is inescapable. That's what that's saying. And also because we have a third axis, so we need to accommodate something. Maybe. Okay. Now, this ket representation is abstract, and there's a concrete representation with respect to the desired basis. Right. So it has is it has the form of a column vector with two components. Each component is a complex number. But if you're given two numbers here, if you're given a column vector and two numbers here, that by itself doesn't tell you anything. You need to know the basis with respect to which um, you're given those numbers. So let's choose the simplest. We are focused, we, our, our basics, basic measurement is in the up direction. So let's say up get will be represented concretely by the vector one zero, column vector one zero, and the down get by zero one. So now you can easily write down a concrete representation of in out left and right. Alright, how many parameters do we need to fit to fix a direction? How many numbers do you need to specify? To fix a direction in three-dimensional real space, I should say real space here. In other words, in the laboratory, in the lab, in the laboratory. <coughs> so, how many numbers do you need? If I want to, if I want to uh, rotate this, if I want uh, to specify an orientation of this pen in three-dimensional space, real space, our space here, how many numbers? What's the minimum number? Three. Two. Three? For, like, to specify the orientation. Or just the orientation? Yeah. Three. Sure. Can, you, can you do it with less? With, uh, you need, what? You need no, to do that. Two, maybe. With the order. Two. Two. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay. I can see what you mean by three, 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 because if you have three axes, uh, yeah, see the, Z, Y, X. There's an angle from the angle from the Z axis, angle from the Y axis, oh, okay. so and two, angle uh, from the from the from the X axis, okay. angle from the Y axis. Indeed. So one way to do it is specify three numbers, but the the, the short the shorter way is two numbers. So if you have a look at if you if you draw the unit sphere. So any point, any point on the unit sphere can be specified by, there's the z-axis, and there's that point. That's, um, that's one, what's this? One, this is uh, theta, and phi is, this is now the x-axis, so this is, this is phi. So, um, um, one theta phi. Hang on. This is cos theta. Um, what's what's the x x value? X y z equals sine theta. Sine theta cos phi. Cos phi. Sine, sine theta, theta sine phi, phi and cos theta. Not right, just through polar coordinates. Okay, just a unit, just a unit sphere. Okay, so you just need two numbers, theta and phi. So, so I only need two numbers, and and those, those two numbers, it's a it's a pair uh, vector theta phi. Um, give a direction which is given, which is denoted n 
hat, which is a univector, and this specifies an orientation um, in space. Okay. So you only need two real numbers to specify the orientation of the spin. And yet, so far, we've had that, that we need two complex numbers, alpha up and alpha down, to specify a state of the spin. Now, so that would seem, now, and, and how many, so we have two complex numbers, but how many parameters, or how many numbers does that mean really? If you have two complex numbers, because each complex number, alpha up is, um, is, um, is the real part of alpha up plus i times the imaginary part of alpha up. In other words, um, a plus i b, where a, b are real, right? So each complex number implies two free parameters. So here we've got two plus two, four free parameters. And yet, you only need two free parameters to specify direction. So what's going on? Somehow, it looks like we've got two, uh, we have more parameters that we can possibly specify. I mean, let's, oh, we've got wasted parameters in the description. But in fact, they're not wasted because we have another, we have one more equation. In fact, we have one more equation coming from the normalization of the arbitrary vector A. That gives one equation between the complex numbers. So that cuts down the, the, the number from four to three. And then there's actually another one. The fact that the overall phase factor doesn't matter, in fact, that gives another um, equation that that um, that limits knocks out another one of the um, free parameters. If you like, you can, you can try having a look at that. Try try seeing that if you want. Right? You, don't, you don't have to just have a go. So these so we have two extra equations, and so therefore we have four parameters to start with, but then two are specified by these two equations. So in fact, we have exactly enough freedom in this superposition to describe all possible orientations of the spin. So it all works out. Works out sort of okay so far. So let's construct the spin operator. The operators to represent components of spin, signal X, signal Y, signal Z. These are components of what's called a three-vector operator. Now, this is a new type of object that you've never seen before. So this is like this is like a three-component vector. Something here, something here, something here. However, each component is itself an operator. We're going to um, we're going to represent operators as matrices. And so, in fact, what it's going to be a two by two matrix. So in fact, you've got a two by two matrix there, a two by two matrix there, and a two by two matrix there. That's the object that that's going to be. That's going to be your spin operator. This is going to be the sigma x operator, sigma y operator, and sigma z operator. There. So this is a new type of object. So we construct the easiest one first, the simplest one, sigma z operator. What's the experimental input? We know that sigma z has definite unambiguous values for the states up and down. With measured values, plus one or minus one. So what are the principles? Each component of this operator, should be operator sigma, will be represented by a linear operator. So linear operator. There, there's an explanation for that, which will give them kind of an intuitive explanation. Principle two, the possible measurements, possible, um, um, the, 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 the two, two possible um, directions, if you like, for measurement, are the basis vectors. These are going to be eigenvectors of the operator. 
and the possible outcomes of the measurement will be the eigenvalues corresponding to the eigenvector. Okay. So the for up, the the ket up, the eigenvalue is plus one. And for ket down, the eigenvalue is minus one. So what that is saying, that sigma z operating on the up vector is plus one times the up vector. So the if you remember you all did the exercise. What is this minus one for Oh, sigma z operating on the down vector is minus one times the down vector. Uh, why is it minus one? Why can't it be all? Because the, the eigenvalue, the result of the experiment, um, when you measure the, the up direction, if, if you, if you uh, If you do this, and the result is plus one, you're doing that. If you do this, and the result is minus one, you're doing that. So, in, in somehow the eigenvalues encode the result. Yes, the eigenvalues encode the result, the possible results. And the last one, it obviously, is orthogonality. So, using that information, let's see what we can do. Um, we're going to represent the operators as, as matrices. We have two basis vectors, so we only need two by two matrix. So, the, uh, the operation sigma z acting on the up vector will be this two by two matrix acting on one zero. Now, this equal sign is, um, would be viewed with horror by purists because this is an abstract notation and this is a concrete notation. So I would not, um, uh, this is not really equal to it. It's kind of like, I don't know, like that. I think, I think uh, Shankar uses the right arrow to instead of equals, you should say equals, not. Abstract cannot equal concrete. Yeah, don't worry about it. If you don't want it, <laughs> don't worry about it if you don't want it. It's, it's kind of pedantic. Anyway. All right, here goes. So that equals that. Okay, so that actually gives us what does it give you? Multiplied out, it tells us that sigma z11 is 1, sigma z21, sigma z11 is 1, sigma z21 is 0. Yes. Okay, uh, so that gives us two values. And how about this one? Sigma z, um, that times that gives us two more equations. So sigma z one, two equals zero, sigma z two, two equals minus one. So they actually specify, we have four equations and four unknowns. So we specify, we can specify the, um, the matrix, and there it is. 1, 0, 0, minus 1. Yeah. Notice that there are 1, the eigenvalues are on the diagonal, and there are zeros everywhere else. So this is a diagonal matrix. Is that a coincidence? Why is this a diagonal matrix? Because Because we are representing the, the entries, the, the matrix elements are calculated according relative to the, 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 Z, the Z basis, the up down basis. So an operator is diagonal in, in its own basis. Okay, what about the sigma X operator? We have eigenvectors right will be plus one and left will be minus one. And this corresponds to the measurement, the apparatus pointing to the right and measuring either plus one or minus one. If it measures minus one, you got that. Okay. Uh, professor, what confusion would happen if, if I wrote plus one for work? As in, in, in what, you what, you think what you're saying is that the result of this experiment will be plus one. 
So you, you, you are encoding the wrong information. But would it matter in the after that, if I do any math? Um, it just means that you'll be, you'll be, everyone, you'll pass your math, mathematical computer program, whatever, to the, the next student, and they'll be making wrong calculations. And then the professor will come back and say, who is this guy who encoded plus one there? as a possible result of the experiment. Right, so the eigenvalue, this is called an eigenvalue equation, okay? Sigma x r equals plus one times r, it's, an eigen, it's called an eigenvalue equation. And similarly, you've got that one there. And um, then you write down what r is in terms of the up-down basis there. And you want it concrete, so there's the um, concrete representation. And you use the concrete representation to work out the elements, the, the matrix elements. These are called matrix elements. So for the rest of the year, and if you're going on with physics, probably for the rest of your life, you'll be calculating matrix elements. Anyway, um, exercise, uh, I think it's in the, in the assignment on that. The sigma x operator is zero, uh, is zero, one, one, zero. Yeah. And for sigma y, what you get is 0i minus i0. Yeah. And so the spin operator, which is a three vector operator, means a, a vector with three components, um, is that. Um, by the way, does anyone know the name of these, these matrices? Have you heard of that before? Pauli spin matrix? Pauli spin matrices. The Pauli spin matrices. Alright. Um, and do you know who the first person was to derive the Pauli spin matrices? Oh, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> but there's a, there's a saying, um, um, Sir, what's it, Michael Berry at Bristol University says, said that every discovery has been credited to someone, has been credited wrongly because it was probably discovered by somebody else before. So the first person to calculate or discover the Pauli spin matrices was Hamilton, Hamiltonian mechanics, Hamilton, like 18, whenever it was, right? In connection with uh, a representation of rotations in real space, using two by two matrices. So there's a deep connection between the spin operator and rotations in three-dimensional space. So I was in classical Yeah, the I was there in classical can be can can um, be this can be derived from classical mechanics. Yeah. That's in if you want to read more that's in um, Goldstein Goldstein, second edition, chapter nine, second edition, and they got rid of it in the third edition. Don't know why. But it's a really interesting uh, section. Anyway, the and the uh, sigma Z. Blah, 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 blah. Okay, so what have we got? Let's have a look at how the um, the formalism works. Um, so. I'll just, I'll just write this out so you can see it happening in front of your eyes. So the sigma z operator acting on, let's say, right, is the sigma z operator acting on the superposition, one on square root of two up, plus one on square root of two down. Down. Now sigma z is a linear operator, so it distributes over addition. So let me write down, um, in sort of slightly extra detail. I'm putting in each step here, spelling out each step. So this is distribution, distributed property of um, 
linear operators over over plus addition, and then this. which is the distributive property. Now what is this? Uh, commutative property. The, the property. It's commutative. The, the, uh, a, a, a real number of, a, a number, a constant times an operator um, equals an operator times a constant. So it's commutativity. So you forgot the operator before the... Thanks. Okay. And now, one on screw two, the result of this is plus one times up, and the result of sigma acting on down is minus one down. So the, 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 the result of the sigma z operator acting on right is one on root two up minus one on root two down. So what that is telling us is that if you did, if you prepared the state, the right state, and then you rotate the apparatus to point in the plus z direction, the probability of getting, of measuring up is a half, and the probability of measuring down is a half. So this, is, this is how the, this is the shikumi, the mechanics. Shikumi is a great word in Japanese. So the, the mechanics of the, the, the machinery of quantum mechanics. Okay. The machinery of quantum mechanics is how it works. Um, Suskin 2 goes on to construct the spin operator sigma n for arbitrary direction measurements along the arbitrary direction n. Um, I don't want to do that because I've, I've shown the point. I've, I've, I've said, I think I've shown the point of how the, the, how the um, mechanism of, of quantum mechanics works a little bit. You can read Suskin 2 if you want, but we're going to do it in QM3 from higher principles anyway. We'll have a break in a minute. Um, there's one very important, uh, I guess, thing to keep in mind, and that is the difference between the mathematical model and the actual physical experiment. So sigma z hat is meant to represent a measurement when the apparatus is pointing in that direction, right? and that's, that's the z-axis. Um, but here when it's operating on this vector, the result is the result is a superposition. And a superposition tells us the relative probability of measuring that or that. But in the actual physical measurement, if you if you measured it and you got a plus one, the result of the measurement is that the spin is definitely pointing up. So in the, in, the actual, in the actual physical experiment, the result is that the spin is measuring is, is pointing straight up, definitely. Um, you mean, that definitely means if you do another measurement after, you'll get 100% probability with 100% probability spin up. But the mathematical theory, the operator operates on whatever state the system's in, and you get a superposition. And superposition tells you the relative probability of all the possible outcomes. So it's a difference between the reality and the representation of reality. Um, okay, so let's have a 10 minute break. Actually, you know, it looks like a lot of pages, but we actually skip a lot. Oh, a lot.
Spencer is probably only about half an hour left. We have a 10 minute break. There's some basic questions that uh, we want to be assured about somehow. First of all, how do we know that we have enough eigenvalues and eigenvectors to be able to describe all the possible outcomes of an experiment? Well, um, there are two answers to this. First of all, the eigenvalues and eigenvectors are a property of the operator that corresponds to the observable that the experiment is measuring. But um, there's also, okay, and that means we want what's called a complete set of basis vectors. <coughs> So that's, that's a very important um, concept, the concept of complete set, the concept of completeness. Okay. If we have a complete set of eigenvectors, then uh, we, can, we know all the possible results of the experiment. It may be that, of course, that our, our operator is wrong or something for some reason, but we don't, uh, haven't encoded everything into the theory, then we have to uh, find some other operator, but that's, that's a different sort of question. Well, another thing is that whenever you do an experiment and you measure some observable, the result is always a real number. So all the experiments in, 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 in the world give you real numbers as results. But that means that the eigenvalues uh, yeah. must of any legal, in some sense, operator that we want to use must be real. We must have real eigenvalues because the eigenvalues are the outcomes of the experiments. Now, what kind of operators guarantee real eigenvalues? Right? That's something that we'll answer in the next few weeks. Now, the third thing is something that uh, Susskind calls conservation of information. So when an operator operates, uh, corresponding to some observable, operates on a state vector, we need an assurance that experimental possibilities don't disappear because the operator somehow zaps them out of existence. Right? Um, what, that really, what that means is, is that n-dimensional spaces must be mapped into n-dimensional spaces. So, um, if you want to call it prosaically, uh, sort of metaphorically, the dimensions must be somehow kept apart, not allowed to collapse. Right? So what guarantees this? Does anyone know of him? What guarantees that a linear operator does not, um, that it maps n-dimensional spaces into n-dimensional spaces? Conservation of information? No, no, no. Um, linear algebra. <laughs> oh, as, as a yeah, what, what guarantees it? Uh, so it has to be like, uh, one, two. Kernel is? So zero. 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 The dimension of the kernel is zero. Right. Okay. And, and then so the invertible. 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 Or invertible, right. So the, the matrix has to be operator. The matrix has to be. Did you represent as a matrix? The matrix has to be invertible. Right? And then no, no vector should be mapped to zero. Right. right. No exactly. vector is mapped to zero. Oh, oh and then zero, zero vector. Right. Yeah. Then it's one to one and on to, right? So us and authors, right? Um, also, the the um, the eigenvectors corresponding to the eigenvalues. Now here you just see the notation for the first time. Um, the ket here is labelled with the actual eigenvalue. So that, that's that's a typical notation, okay? So this is the ket with the, with the uh, corresponding to the eigenvalue there, the i. These have to be orthogonal, and this is their only relevant property. Uh, so we might as well work with unit vectors, in other words, orthonormal eigenvectors. What guarantees that the orthonormal eigenvectors exist? Um, okay, so this bit here is just the one-to-one uh, -one mapping thing. And now here, in this little bit, I want to, I want to talk about, just, just show you how to, uh, the basic point is the last one here, how these matrix elements are found relative to a particular basis. Oh, alpha, that's, that's, a, that's a vector. Okay, so 
Suppose we have two states, A and B, and each is a superposition. Now we're working in the in the this basis. We call this the J basis. Okay, we're working in the J basis. A is a, is uh, has is this superposition? The coefficients are alpha J, and B is this superposition. Coefficients are beta, beta J. Now substitute this into this equation here, which is suppose that B is the operator M acting on the, the state A. Let's just suppose because M is a linear operator, it acts on on a vector and it's going to give another vector because that's that's what operators do. Um, Alright, so just substitute that into here. Now I'll, I'll uh, that probably don't have to write it out. So A is the superposition with the alpha J's, there it is there. The M is a linear operator, so it distributes over addition and it commutes with scalar multiplication. Here it distributes over addition, so it comes in here. And it and it commutes with scalar multiplication, so it does that. And now it operates directly on each basis vector. So here it was operating on the superposition. Here it's operating directly on each on each basis vector, and the and the results of oh, okay and, and because and, and I'll just um, write it in this way here. Um, the result of M J is some is some um, is some other superposition, and 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 if I absorb alpha j into this superposition then you're going to have some other vector b to j um, sum of j b to j j this is just um, th this creates a superposition and um, the alpha j times that superposition is just some other b to j times the basis vectors and you have the same number of uh, of j's here j equals one to n here one to n. Right. Um, so now I'll take the inner product of both sides of this with a basis vector k. Now this is something that I will work out. So, so to take the inner product, I pre-multiply, I suppose this is the way, this is the typical language used, by this thing here. Now this thing here uh, is the complex conjugate of this thing here. Now, what we what this actually means, we'll uh, we'll see next week with in the in the um, Kantanuji extract. Okay, this is uh, this is something. Um, okay, that just keep just call that that. Remember that for now. Um, so now, and we'll go to. Um, where do we want to go? Far to here. That's why I wrote it this way. So K acting on sum over J, M hat J, of J. Now taking the inner product, the inner product is also a linear operation. Okay. Um, that's again something you'll see next week or investigate more fully. So it distributes over addition and commutes with scalar multiplication, but we're not going to commute it. Distributes over addition. Now, this thing here, see, there is, the way you read this is that the result of this is a vector. We know, we, we've called it the vector B. And then, this acting on a vector, this is, you can think of this as a vector, this acting on a vector, so this is just a, just a scalar product, I mean, in, in, in a product. So now we have this, and now we have vector, a basis vector there and a basis vector there, and in between, sandwiched in between, is the operator. This thing here is defined as, uh, call, it defined, call it M, little m subscript kj, and the reason why we do that is that um, is that now 
that equals sum over j and looking at this bit here k j b to j now these things are orthonormal so the inner product of all of these inner products is zero except when j equals k so this picks out j equals k and that leaves b to j but b to k like that and here we have so we have here we have sum over mkj alpha j equals b to k or uh, yeah that now this thing here you might recognize as the component form of matrix multiplication so that thing there is the same as a matrix m acting on a column vector alpha yeah. okay and except this is this is just one one row of the matrix the kth row this is the kth row of the matrix acting on on that column vector right. um, so this thing here where the operator is sandwiched between two basis vectors is called a matrix element it's a matrix element And so what you've basically found is these MKJs and you've basically found this equation here and if you find all the MKJs then you know how to write this equation and you know how to write down this matrix in component form relative to the J basis. So each of these entries is a number which makes sense, and you know that it's relative to this particular chosen J basis. Okay, so that's essentially how that's that's how to find um, one. This is uh, the finite dimensional way of finding matrix elements. Okay. okay. Skip that. Skip that. Skip that. Um, if you like, you can. Um, maybe a good idea would be just to. Uh, uh, read, um, read, just read this section, this section from Susskind 2 over the weekend, um, section 3.1. You'll see that it's ex very, very simple. Uh, the Susskind books, as I said a few weeks ago, are written for people who haven't done physics before, right? which seems amazing because he, he actually gets, touches the core of modern physics in sort of simple language. So you can you can read these, especially have a look at this M dagger notation, and and here is this thing here. This is called a bra. We'll find out more about that um, later um, next week, the next week and week after. Um, you can just have a look at that. And um, okay, but it's very simple when you. The, what you should be doing is having the required energy, and that's the level you want to get to. Okay, so let's summarize what we've done into a set of principles, the principles of quantum mechanics. And now these principles are the ones that uh, are, are, are sort of my selection from Susskind 2 and Shankar. So the principles involve the idea of an observable and they presuppose the existence of an underlying complex vector space whose vectors represent system states. In this section, we present the four principles that do not involve the evolution of the state vectors with time. And then, we'll add one more principle regarding time evolution. Now, just um, a colloquial definition, an observable is something you can measure with a suitable apparatus. Examples are the components sigma x, sigma y, sigma z of the spin operator sigma. Principle one, the observables are represented by linear operators. Okay, this just summarizes what I already said, so I don't need to say it again. Everything we've got up until now 
has been in, with a viewpoint that in the end we're going to rotate the apparatus so that it points in the same direction as the positive z axis and we'll make the measurement. So the state is prepared in some arbitrary um, orientation, prepared in this orientation, and we rotate the apparatus and we do this measurement. So we have used the up-down basis. We've been measuring sigma z in the end. What if in our laboratory the z-axis was instead in that direction or in any other direction? How does that change our results? Doesn't. Yeah. Doesn't. Um, we just redefine everything. Does it make any difference? Does it, does it, you mean we initially had z pointing in one direction and we changed it? No. Suppose that um, the next day, the, the first day, you did all these experiments with the z-axis pointing that way, and then overnight, uh, another grad student came in and knocked your apparatus, and now your apparatus is pointing that way, or something inside is broken and is tilted. And now you redo all your, all your um, measurements. You start off, you know, the z-axis is now pointing that way. And you redo everything the way we've done it. We can express that z as, a, as something in terms of that z. And whatever measure is going to get on just that. Mm. And what do you get in the end? Is it does it change anything? Mm. Maybe, uh, maybe I don't think so. Why? Why? Yeah, I think so. Why? Why? Because it's with respect to that z. Yeah. And and everything is just shifted. So. Why is it the same? Why, why do you expect nothing to change, really? Is, is there anything special about, about this direction in space? No. There's nothing special about... Do you mean to reference? Isn't it against point? Yeah. Right. But there's, nothing, there's nothing special about any particular direction in space. Space is isotropic. Right. No, but is it... The special thing is that the particle has. Uh, we 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 define this. We start off by measure by defining the up down basis in terms of measurements when the when the mm -hmm. when the apparatus is pointing that way, right? And if there's now the z axis is pointing that way and our apparatus is pointing that way, we're not really changing anything. We just redo everything. Starting with the z-axis pointing that way. So because we prepared the apparatus initially to a particular reference direction, right? The previous directions don't matter, right? Right. So, so you can rederive everything that we've done with the z-axis pointing that way, and it makes no difference to the, the all the matrices and everything that we found because there is no preferred direction in space. Space is isotropic. All right. Um, uh, a change of basis. Sometimes, okay, we need a change of basis. Uh, supposing that we did want to change our point of view, then we would use a unitary transformation on the operator. Unitary transformation meaning one that keeps the lengths of the vectors constant. A unitary transformation in a, um, in, a, in a, we talk of unitary transformations in a complex vector space, orthogonal transformations in a real vector space. The, the, the result is the same, the lengths of vectors are constant. Why do we want the lengths of vet vectors constant? Because the length of the vector tells us the relative probability, or the length of each component, if you like, tells us the relative probability of, of measuring that uh, in an experiment. So if you rotate the space, we want to make sure that the lengths are the same and that the, it stays orthogonal, that they stay orthogonal. Right. Perfect. So that's a unity transformation. Yeah. Professor, suppose I did this experiment 
and uh, somehow like if I had done it again in the same way, would it, would it be the same result? Ultimately, the result, unless you have two special positions, the result is random. So any single measurement will give you a random number. So even if, suppose for example, I had exactly the same measurement somehow in like two different places. Or, so, or like everything has been going the same up to now. And then when you do the same thing at the same time, it still would be random. Yeah. If you get two copies of the experiment, one will measure plus one and the other one will measure minus one, or, or plus one, plus one, uh, whatever the, you know, they'll be uncorrelated, but there'll be two random numbers that are uncorrelated. Yeah. Um, so we want to keep the, we do not, if we rotate the apparatus, I mean, if we rotate our, our reference at reference direction, uh, we want to make sure that all the um, lengths of vectors are the same and all the, and the, and the angles are 90 degrees or the orthogonal. So you want a unitary transformation of the operator. And so, um, that's, that gives us the change of basis. And that means we're going to use a simple, need a similarity transformations, which is what I talked about in the optional lecture 3B. Okay. Um, what's a property of the invertible matrix that is unaffected by a unitary change of basis? Very important property. To the trace. Some. Yeah, the sum of the, the diagonals. No, the sum of the, what's on the diagonal, not necessarily eigen vectors. Some of the, what's on the diagonal? Yeah. The Some of the, the entries on the diagonal is invariant change of uh, uh, under unitary change of basis. So you can have a matrix where you have a lot of off diagonal elements. You just add up the diagonal. If you rotate it such that um, the basis makes the, um, is the natural basis for the operator, then you have a diagonal matrix. The trace will be the same. What is the, what physically, what does it mean? The, what is, would the sum mean physically? Um, In this case. We'll get to that later. Not today. Okay, principle two. The possible results of a measurement are the eigenvalues lambda i of the operator that represents the observable. The state for which the result of a measurement is unambiguously lambda i is the corresponding eigenvector the ket lambda i. Okay? So the ket is labeled with the eigenvector, it's a standard notation. The operator corresponding to the observable can be constructed once and for all from all the eigenvectors in one basis. If the basis is changed because the apparatus is uh, rotated and we want a different reference um, direction, then a similarity transformation transforms the operator. It changes each the value of each entry in the matrix representation, uh, but and it gives us the, the the correct experimental prediction. Okay? That's how the how it works. Principle three: unambiguously distinguishable states are represented by orthogonal vectors. Principle four: if the ket A is a state vector of the system and the observable M is measured, the probability to observe the value lambda i is, is the ket A projected onto the eigen basis lambda i times the complex conjugate of this inner product. That's the reading from right to left. Okay. And that's in the complex, complex, complex notation, that's the modulus of this complex number squared. Okay. So, um, uh, if if uh, z is a complex number, then the modulus of z is um, z star z con z conjugate z. Okay. That's that's just um, a simple notation. Z squared. Um, <coughs> physically distinct states. 
two states are physically distinct if a measurement exists after rotating the apparatus if necessary that can tell them apart without ambiguity. Uh, you can read the rest of that for yourself. Right. Now, so that's the principle. So now, the, part, the last thing we want is we want to know how a state vector evolve, evolves in time. So we want an equation of motion for the state vector. So, what's the equation of motion in quantum mechanics? Now, the Hamiltonian is the is the energy is a, is an energy matrix is the energy that you start off with the energy operator. And what's the, the Schrodinger equation? Is the equation of motion? Right? The equation of motion in classical mechanics, the Hamiltonian mechanics, are the Hamiltonian Hamilton's equations. In quantum mechanics, it's Schrodinger's equation. Right? So let's derive Schrodinger's equation. We want a dynamical law that preserves the experimental information encoded in the vector as it's evolving. So, so what it must do, it must preserve the distinction between your basis vectors. So it must preserve the orthogonality um, and also um, if it is an arbitrary linear combination, it must preserve the uh, coefficients. Although it can multiply the coefficients by an overall phase factor, and it won't make any difference. So what you need is that the, the evolution must be a unitary transformation. You must be rotating the vector in time, uh, with time. So you, so the equation of motion of the vector, the state vector, is a rotation in the vector space in which you're describing it, the abstract vector space. So, uh, okay, so these are, um, I think, these are, these are uh, things that you're familiar with already. Um, so if U, definition, if U is a linear operator on a complete inner product space, so we want a complete inner product space. Complete means we have enough eigenvectors to describe every, every possible outcome of the experiment. The U dagger, it denotes the conjugate transpose of U. So for example, if U is a two by two matrix, A, B, A, B, C, D like that, the U dagger is the transpose of the complex conjugate of U, uh, which means that you can, can, can first conjugate each complex number here, A star, B star, C star, D, D star, and then take the transpose. So you've got, you've got uh, C, uh, C star ends up there, B star ends up there, A star, D star, star the diagonal. Definition, the unitary transformation, U is a transformation that preserves the inner product between two vectors. For example, uh, I, if, if H is a complete inner product space and X, Y is in H, then if you transform each vector um, by the same unitary transformation, the inner product of the result equals um, the original inner product. That's what we want. That's the definition of unitary transformation. In particular, if x and y, um, if, if x, is, if these are the same vector here, then the transform, the inner product of the transformed vector with itself is equal to the inner product of the original vector. So that's saying that, if you, for example, if you start off with uh, two, uh, a basis vector, you rotate it. If it's orthogonal here, then it's going to be orthogonal here. This is practically what we want. Uh, theorem, U is unitary if and only if U, U dagger equals I, if and only if U dagger U equals I. In other words, U dagger is the inverse of U. Um, I won't worry about the proof. You can read the proof if you want. Clearly, the time evolution operator on the, on the complex, uh, now I'll start I'll call it, calling it a Hilbert space, because that's what it actually is. Uh, must act as a rigid rotation of quantum state vectors. 
I'm calling it a Hilbert space. A Hilbert space is a generalized Euclidean space. Euclidean space is a space where the basis vectors are 90 degrees to each, orthogonal to each other. Um, a Euclidean space could have could be a real vector space or a complex vector space. Uh, if it's a complex vector space, it's called a Hilbert space. It could be finite dimensional or infinite dimensional. So the time evolution operator, which we're going to call U, uh, must act as a rigid rotation of, of quantum state vectors to conserve information. <coughs> so U must be unitary. So principle five, quantum time evolution is unitary. This, uh, yeah, this preserves the orthogonality of the state vector components and therefore preserves experimental information. Um, we can come to the same conclusion mathematically as follows. Consider a closed system that at time t is in the quantum state psi of t, okay, at time t. Mm, closed uh, just means that nothing's going to influence it from outside. Nothing, there are no extra possible experimental results going to sneak in while during the evolution. So the time origin may as well be t equals zero. Right. So any time t is really equivalent if you want to take a starting point. It's, it's kind of a, it, it doesn't sound important, but actually it is. It, it will be important. Right. So closed system means you can take t equals zero as your starting point. Something worth remembering. The state at time t is given by some operation u of t acting on psi of zero. So, there is your starting point, starting state, starting vector, psi of zero, the ket, psi of zero. And it's operated on by your unitary time evolution operator, u of t. The result is the, the state at time t. Now, suppose the ket, psi of zero, and the ket, psi of phi of zero and the ket psi of zero are two distinct states at t equals zero. Distinct states means that they are orthogonal. Okay. At t equals zero they are orthogonal. What we want to show is that at time t they are still orthogonal. This is what we want to preserve experimental information. Now, but using the rule that I said before, um, the, we call this a bra, this is a bra psi of t is the bra psi of zero and u dagger acting to, towards the left. At, this is u dagger acting to the left. Okay. And so, um, this, uh, because the bra is the complex conjugate of the ket. So it's bracket. Yeah, bracket. Bra. Ket. Yeah, you blame, blame Dirac. <laughs> but you were thinking something else. <laughs> <laughs> so just, just blame Dirac. Okay. So, 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 that's this here, you see. Just there. This, this uh, should be, this is star, star, T, um, in fact, in fact, this should be the other way around. The same thing goes for the final. Oh, so, 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 so we want see psi of t is that. Substitute that into there. Now psi phi of t is 
is just u of t phi of 0. So here in the middle, so here we've got bra phi of 0, psi of 0, and sandwiched in between is u dagger u phi of 0, and that equals i. So <clears throat> Which is what we started off with. Then this is what we started off with zero. So because U is a unitary operator, at this step here we can say that this is I. And so it works out like that. Okay, um, you can read that a bit if you want. Now, generator of infinitesimal time translations. So, now this ties in with what we've been doing in the classical mechanics part in the last few weeks. Okay. But it's actually much simpler in, in quantum mechanics. So we have already seen that the time evolution operator must be unitary. We also assume continuity. What that means is that the state at time, the state at time t equals epsilon, if epsilon is an arbitrary small number, then the, then, the, uh, then the norm must be, um, must be arbitrarily small. So to continuity means that as this number here rises from zero, the difference between the vectors also rises from zero. It doesn't, and, and continuously, it doesn't jump to some number. And continuity, so continuity means. Um, so, but anyway, so, but because of that, what that really means is that, see, u of zero means do nothing, identity operator. If you do nothing, it's the identity operator. Um, if, uh, now, a time epsilon later, we want the operator to be um, epsilon, but to be keep it first order. One argument is in analogy with the classical case, but it really comes from the algebra. Um, and, this, and then G is going to be what's called the generator of the time evolution. Oh, and this has to be, this is a minus sign. Why is it a minus sign and not a plus sign? <coughs> yeah, you need to get it. It's because of the definition of the Fourier transform that Schrodinger used in his original paper. Because the Fourier transform can be like integral of either the minus i, you know, um, omega t either, or either the plus i omega t. There are lots of different definitions of Fourier transform. So because he chose, this is what I think, okay. Um, he, because he chose one particular definition, that, that implies that the rotation is in a certain direction in, in the abstract, in the Hilbert space. And so it implies a minus sign there. Yeah. Hey? Yeah, well, yeah, you're yeah. Well, I mean, really. well you, you're just prejudiced against pluses, the minuses. All right. So the inverse. Now, remember that u dagger is the inverse of u. So the inverse of um, that means that u dagger is i minus psi g dagger, and dagger just 
um, distributes over everything inside. So that's epsilon, just a number, and that's g dagger. Okay. But we also have that epsilon is a real number. Real number. Real number. Yeah. It's time. Um, you can. It is. It, it can be useful to think of time as a complex number in statistical mechanics, which maybe I'll mention in lecture 15 of SP2. But anyway, I minus now u dagger u has to equal i, so that gives us a condition that will tell us something about g. So u dagger u is i minus epsilon g dagger times i minus epsilon g. Now multiply this out. I, I times I is I. Um, I times as the other uh, minus uh, epsilon g dagger minus epsilon g, and there's plus terms of order epsilon squared which we, we ignore. So we're working to first order in epsilon. Now that has to equal I because of, because u u dagger is the inverse of u. So that implies that that equals zero. So that g dagger equals g. And what's that mean? G dagger is? G dagger is. Oh, uh, no, no, no. Minus, minus g. Minus g. Then what's, what's, the, what's this called? Uh, is it permission? Anti permission. Anti permission. Implies g is. Anti permission. Okay. So and it has no dagger. So it has no dagger. Um. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean that's what it means. Which implies, necessarily, implies that G is I times some matrix. Which is emission. Yeah. Oh, how, how does that apply? Uh, ah, because um, an anti-commission matrix can always be built from a permission matrix if you multiply the commission matrix by I. Because then I I'm gonna call this H. I H dagger is I H dagger. Uh, minus i h dagger, so that takes care of the minus sign, oh. and then that will be minus i h if h is emission. So then this is oh. this is g dagger is that 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 which equals minus, um, minus g, okay. which is okay, right? Dun, 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 dun. So and we're going to call this um, hmm, but why do we call this h? H for permission. Oh. H is permission, so it must be an observable. Um, I haven't proved this, but just take it for granted because we're going to prove it like next week or in, in a couple of weeks. Um, now, this is the generator of infinitesimal time translations. So what could it be? Oh. So, quantum, well, what's the argument here? Mm. Well, one argument is that quantum mechanics must reduce to classical mechanics in the classical limit. So H must be the Hamiltonian. We should identify, take the limit to the classical limit, if you like. In the limit, the two theories have to be the same. So H must be the must be whatever the Hamiltonian is in quantum mechanics. But doesn't that mean that like if you take the limit, then the limit in then, the it converges, then it converges to the classical Hamiltonian. But it doesn't mean that it's actually Yeah, that's a very good point. Yeah. This is this is like a hand waving argument. Right. But still, whatever this is, it's a generator of time translations. And in fact, in uh, in QM three, we showed that 
it's the Hamiltonian has that property. Yeah. Okay. Um, now, the only, you know, if this is the Hamiltonian, the only problem is that if the units would be wrong, because I has no units, epsilon is time, so in fact we would have to um, divide by h bar to have the right units, right dimensions. The <laughs> Hobie. Well, okay, divide by some small number of units of angular momentum. Is what it, would that be? But wouldn't we have to do it like... Oh, Alright, that's a bit hand wavy, right? Yeah. <laughs> Just slightly. You need to bring the h bar from somewhere. Huh? Like, either like multiply something. Oh, uh, what we do is we get to the answer, show that it works, and then you argue backwards. But, so yeah, so it's it's typical, typical mathematical technique. Have a guess. And it gives you the right answer, then, so it's going to be right. So where would we have changed? Where would we have put h bar? Like on what step to, um, to have this, this thing? This is this. If this is a Hamiltonian, then the units of this are wrong. This has no units. Oh, okay. So this has to be dimensionless. Okay. okay. This has to be dimensionless. So from the definition of the transformation, or is it epsilon? Can we write epsilon as? This is the. This is seconds. That's seconds. So can you write the seconds over h bar? Seconds over h bar, which is joule seconds. So that gives you joules in the denominator. H would have the units of energy, dimensions of energy. Joules over joules. Cancels out. What's the simplest possible thing? Oh, H. Oh, some small number of units. Angle of minimum. Oh, H bar. Or anything, call it h bar, and then and then then it'll work out. And you get some equation, and then make an experimental prediction that we measure h bar, and you find it's what we call h bar. All right. So that's the logic. This h bar is anything with dimensions joule seconds or units joule seconds. All right. And then we'll work out an equation, and then. You know, make some prediction for an experiment, measure h bar, and it's going to be Planck's constant divided by 2 pi. Right, so that's the logic. So, but we call it h bar. I call, call this, you know, what, what, what's that? What's that? Uh, Aleph zero. Aleph. Aleph, Aleph zero. Aleph zero. Right? Call it Aleph zero. Anything. Aleph zero is a constant in um, chaos theory. Anyway, who cares? So therefore, what we have is that is that the time evolution operator um, evaluated at very short time epsilon operating on the initial state gives the state at a short a short time later psi epsilon. So, but the unitary operator is i minus i on h bar epsilon h there like that. Um, now, if I take, if I put the, this side of zero on this side, so I've got that minus that, that minus that, and then take the epsilon onto the left hand side, I have psi of epsilon, the cap psi of epsilon minus psi of zero divided by epsilon equals minus i on h bar times the original cap, initial cap. Now you take the limit as epsilon tends to zero, right? and then this is by definition d by dt. Oh, replace zero by some arbitrary time. So what about the h? The, the h uh, psi zero of the one above. The, the h what happens? That yeah. So it's in there. Oh, it does. It's, it's gone. Yep. So now that turns into the derivative respect to time of the state of psi of, psi of t. And it's a partial d because maybe psi is the function, it will be a psi of coordinates, a function of coordinates as well in general. And that equals um, the right hand side, which is um, minus i on h bar h psi of t. We're re replacing zero with. Zero was an arbitrary initial point in it anyway. So just put t instead of zero. 
And so that's the time dependent Schrodinger equation. In, in abstract form, because these are abstract vectors. Then how do you define the agent? Or like, you mean that? Yeah. It has units of energy. As in, how have we said for me that now it is it, it's, 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 um, it's a generator of infinitesimal time translations. So, so it's very, very likely to be the correspond what corresponds the, 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 what corresponds to the Hamilton Hamiltonian in quantum in the quantum mechanics in the quantum mechanical theory. So in, in classical mechanics, H is a function of the Q's and P's, but in quantum mechanics, H will have to be an operator. So it's a, like a completely different theory, and yet these both play the role of an infinitesimal, but it's a generator of infinitesimal time translations. Okay. Um, now we could also argue like this, and this is a very important argument. Um, it'd be very useful to remember it. The energy operator must satisfy the composition law, which means that if you start from the right, if you evolve a state by time t2, and then evolve it by time t1. It must be the same as evolving it by time t1 plus t2 in one big step. I mean, it sounds obvious and reasonable. Right? That's called the composition law. Now, for arbitrary time t, let's partition the interval, this interval, closed interval from 0 to t, into n subintervals. So we have 0 to t and then just partition it into n subintervals okay and um, then using the composition law the u over the one big evolution of the one big step one uh, to time t one big step is the you just multiply n evolutions over small time steps together so that's just u of t to the power of n to the power of n. Okay. Um, this is just a comment that um, this, in fact, implies that the only the length of the subinterval counts, not when it happens. All of these have exactly the same form; they're exactly the same function. So at each time point, exactly the same function brings the state forward by a little bit. What that's saying is that there's no memory. There's nothing changing in the form of that function from one step to the next, just this parameter. There's no memory. It forgets, oh, here I am, I forget where I came from. Oh, here I am, I forget where, it's like a goldfish. Or Yeah, and that is actually um, the essence of linearity. Okay. Anyway, which is, I, I should prove it sometime. But, yeah. Anyway, now I'll take the limit as n tends to infinity. So you've got the limit as n tends to infinity of these evolutions of the small time steps to the power of n. But what's each evolution of the small time step is 1 minus t on n times i on h by times the Hamiltonian or this the mystery operator h which just happens to be the time evolution operator I mean um, you know this is the power of n um, Euler's, Euler's formula says that that's the exponent exponential e to the of minus i on h bar times this operator the exponential operator. Um, oh, look at that. The C shape uh, page 54 to 55, if you want to understand what a function of an operator is, we're going to do it anyway. But if you want to look ahead, you can see that. So H is Hermitian, so U of T is unitary. Um, that's because 
uh, this is easy to prove because um, u dagger of t equals e to the minus i on h bar h hat t dagger, um, which equals it's a bit of a leap here, but we'll do that anyway. E p five and h bar h dagger t, which equals e to the i on h bar h hat because h is emission um, and therefore u dagger u equals e to the i on h bar h hat t times e to the minus i on h bar h hat t which equals i therefore u is unitary as required yeah. Slightly from here to here, which will uh, these pages in Shankar explain um, how how to get from this step to this step. You need to uh, understand what a function of an operator is. It's, you know, these sort of details are part of the um, like the, the, the what we need to learn. Right? Anyway, so H is emission and U is unitary. And so U of T is a rigid rotation of Hilbert space. So this operator here operates on a state psi of zero to give the state psi of T. And essentially what it's doing is rigidly rotating the state in, in the Hilbert space. And, um, and that's it. That's it for today, that's the end point. Thank <laughs> you.